Hi, I'm Ali from Practical Boat Owner Magazine. Really excited today because we're going to go and take a look at a boat which, fingers crossed, is going to be the next PBO project boat. It's a Maxi 84, built in 1980. Um, it's been here in the yard for two years. It's got quite a bit of work to do, um, but the owner, Daniel, has um, very kindly offered it to PBO as our next boat. So we're here um, Ben Sutcliffe Davis, he's a marine surveyor, he's here taking a look at it now and we're going to see how we get on. The surveyors are, should be considered like GPs. We're here to identify the problems, not necessarily be that specialist. We should be able to identify that's not right, that's not right. Like the rigging, you need to go and get a better look at it. Like the gas, you should go and get a better look at it. We should identify basic problems, but the more specialist things should be dealt with by specialists. Like engines, when we come to look at the engine on this yacht, you know, I should be able to tell you the general side of it, but I won't be able to tell you the compression of it. That's an engineer's job. Okay, so um, I've scraped back an area here, so you can see a, a fairly loose anti-foul product at the top here which is an incompatible uh, product to the one that was underneath it. And underneath that coating, if you look really closely, you can now see a grey and a green, where the epoxy manufacturers have basically used uh, two different colours so that when they've applied it, they can tell where they've been. So it's always a good indication when you see, when you scrape back gently or use a little bit wet and dry, you can start seeing the green coming through the grey. Then you know you've got an epoxy coating underneath. Um, so all, all meters are not really moisture meters, I hate to tell you. Um, they're comparative, so basically the top sides there are running at uh, less than 10. I come down here and they're literally running exactly the same. So that gives me an idea that there's very little moisture in the hull. Now, in some of these areas, we're near the anchor locker, we have got a little bit of moisture in here towards the bottom of the hull. So when we go inside, we have a little look and see what's causing that. It may be something really stupid like um, some wet clothing, or some ropes, or even the chain just laying in the bottom of the hull, we'll, we'll throw the meter. Um, when I do a tap testing, and that's really the most important bit to me, you can hear the hull is actually still nice and crisp. So you can see there's been a small repair here, which again looks pretty good. Um, it's, it's obviously faded off. With the UV light and you can see that someone's tried to over cut and uh, wet and dry too much and they actually started going through into the laminate below. So we've got a nice uh, keel joint here, it's, um, it's a stepped keel joint which is actually I think a lot stronger. I like, you can know, empty these while I go ahead, you know you'd be emptying all these for me while I'm doing the outside. Because what's happened in here is the cockpit uh, has had loads of leaves and this is what you're ending up with, this is fantastic compost. Gas lockers. Before you work in any locker, it's always important to make sure that if you're going into the locker, that there's no way the locker can lock with you in it. That may sound really simple, but you'll be amazed how many people always talk about the uh, time they got stuck in a, in, a, in a locker. But something you can always do with any gas locker, doesn't matter what age boat you've got, is, is what I call a bucket test. Basically, if you put water in the top, the only place water should come out is through the deck drain, uh, which is going through the stern end. You see, currently it's going out. But as I suspected, I didn't think it was water type. You see the water running out the bottom there. If you want to look underneath there, you'll see that the backing washers for the winch are all marred steel. So they will need to be changed. Last thing you want to do is be hauling on a sail and watch the winch come off through the deck. I understand the rigging was changed about five years ago and uh, certainly everything we've looked at, the bottle screws, the deck fittings, the chain plates which riggers never check is chain plates and the anchorage inside which we'll go and have a look at later all, all seem fairly good, there's very little moisture around the deck fittings and certainly looking up uh, and sighting where the swages run into the mast they all look fairly nice and straight. Now the edges of it are starting to break down but all the aluminium ones are completely seized in, in their uh, pins. So you need to take, the, there's a 
um, clevis pin on this side you can take out. And you can theoretically pull all these rollers out and, and basically oil them, grease them up, and hope to get them to work again. A couple of hours into the survey now, and Ben is just beside me in the locker, just hammering around. What, what are you checking, Ben? Just make sure the bulkheads are not rotten. Checking the bulkheads are not rotten. <laughs> it's very traditional with what I would call it. It's not it's not a modern boat yard, you know. Yeah, but it's what boat yards were. You know, I've been you know, I trained up at North Shore when I was up there and all the boat yards were like this little ones kind of thing. They kind of become very modern. Um, yeah. You know, you know what I mean? The difference between them. It's lovely. Yeah. Love it. Nice place to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the structure itself isn't strong enough to take its weight, so it's kind of cool. Yeah. And you can see the corrosion joint developing along there. You see the corrosion on that developing. Yeah. Just put it down in here because if any gas was flying around it would end up in this end of the boat. So that's not bleeping uh, ridiculously, it hasn't speeded up. So I'm pretty happy that there's probably no gas in, in the boat. Uh, so we'll carry on doing our survey now. Come on. Okay, so we've got three seacocks in here. They're clearly over five years old by the looks of it. All got with massive corrosion on the actual fittings here. But more importantly, it's the hose tails. Um, this one, this one actually makes me laugh because uh, we talk about double clamping, but the actual clamps are not actually on the end of the hose tail. They actually just fit the double clamps there, so that one should be near the shoulders of the fitting. This one on the end here is not even on the fitting, but they they double clamped it. Completely pointless. Uh, but all these uh, are basically three definite replacements. Uh, the handle on this one here is pretty much seized. That one, this one, yeah. That one is. Uh, yeah, that's pretty well. Got a little bit of movement on it. This, and this one it actually works okay. But frankly, over five years old, chuck them out and start again. Okay. We have a sink unit here. So from the outside of the boat, I know there's a discharge in this area. So I was looking down here, and you've got a removable plywood panel. And I've opened this one up, and I can't find the seacock in there. And here I've... Uh, taking all the saucepans out so you can probably have a look in here and you can see that the discharge hose which is this one is actually running across to here so it's not in what I call the obvious place so bottom drawer out and there's our seacock which is actually an old-fashioned valve um, a sluice valve which is completely and utterly seized so that's something else that'll have to be changed or freed off um, it's more likely that's a bonds one so theoretically bonds is better than uh, the DZR but frankly for the sake of a few quid I'd start with a new valve in there completely um, it's very awkward where it is underneath that drawer as well to get to so that's gonna be fun for someone <laughs> Okay, so uh, this gas cooker, I've just lifted it off the gimbals. It's got a piece of hose at the back here, which is actually dated 1984. Uh, and what's really quite concerning is the fact that really for 
anything that's gimbaled, it should be really a reinforced hose. But it's come through this uh, piece of shielding. Do you see how the gas hose there has been cut slowly where it's been through the shielding? Just there, can you see it? Yeah. So many people have got these in their boats, but a lot of people don't realise there's no uh, thermal cutouts on them. Let's just get rid of that wheel pan a second. So if you're merrily sailing and the gas blows out, gas will freely flow through this without being shut off because there's no thermal cutout. So again, personally, I wouldn't be using this any longer. Yeah, to, to, um, to survey a boat properly all you need is a camera, hammer and a knife and a good, good pair of eyes. That's theoretically all you should need. And you can see the hull is full of moisture. We'll have loads of blisters. Everything else is an aid, moisture meter, all those sort of things, all aids. Um, when you're doing a pre-purchase survey or you're preparing for a pre-purchase survey, it's always nice if people actually empty the lockers. Uh, here I've got about three years supply of sales and life jackets and God knows what else in there. Don't write them down. Yeah. Surveying is like a journey. You know, every time I do it, I always try and do it in, a, in an order. That way it's, when you go to write the report later, it's all good. So just looking for structure, making sure everything's glassed in and bolted in, which it should be. you see the woven rovings in the actual build quality of the boat and most of these uh, yachts from uh, Scandinavia and Finland areas do tend to build woven rovings more than chop strand like the, the Westleys and the Moody's in the UK uh, of this age. More expensive build uh, but as you can see for moisture to get into the end of the filaments it, it, it's very limited because the end of the filaments are like cloth They're at the ends. So water laying in areas like this cannot get into the filaments and start the osmosis reaction in quite the same way. You know, pretty good nick for the age of it, isn't it? Oh, the sailor. Good God, I used to have one on our fishing boat. So the channel selector is this, uh, yes, this one, I think. It used to turn. Been nicely isolated, but as I say, there's no nothing working. So this is an in, this engine is an indirectly cooled uh, Volvo. Um, it's actually a, a Perkins base engine. I think it was the old Perkins Piranha three cylinder. Uh, the, the biggest problem here you've got is the fact with the lack of use and being stood here for some time. Can you see how much corrosion is on things like the flywheel? On the, on the pulley wheel here and it's always worth getting that information because anywhere in the world if you're if you need spares for Perkins it's the same engine uh, and then the Volvo Penta serial number is there underneath the, uh, the fuel pump Looks, they always start with that 510 but it's this last set of digits here somewhere you need which is not, not very easy really They're just stamped in Hear that turning, haven't we? Well, at least we know after two and a half years it hasn't seized, which is a good sign. All right. Great. But they don't feel that bad. I don't know. Just, it just feels a little bit damp up here, so it's hard to trace where the water's coming from because there's so little that you can actually physically see, you know, you look on the deck you think what have we got on the deck that's above it and really it's, it's the port lights and the gouge so that if water, because of the double skins you can feel this is dry in here so the only place that water can be coming from has got to be the ceiling of the unit 
Oh, what's going on here? Where's that moisture coming from? Ah, oh, it's the deck fitting. That's the deck sockets. Okay. Okay, so those deck sockets we got loose, you can see the water is actually running through the internal moulding here and running out through the limber holes that have been fitted for certain items. So that's the water running through the deck, running down into here. And you can see all the rest of it, if I get out of the way, you know, looking there, you can see that water, there you are, skittle last pass. You'll see that, you can see all that water staining, that's not from deck fittings, that's purely water running from the wiring of the mast on the deck where it's loose. Good, isn't it? Uh, there's no anti-siphon in, in this intake either. The intake should also run almost to the underside of the deck with an anti-siphon because there is a risk of flooding the pan because this is just below the waterline. Okay? So um, with sails, again, survey can only see so much to see how good a sail is you really need to take the boat sailing uh, to get an idea but straight away you can see this UV strip here has had its day it's completely worn away and faded and starting to break, break down quite simply uh, the sail itself doesn't feel too bad it's still got that nice little noise to it when you give it a little scrape with your nails but uh, the main which is down there is definitely a lot lot older than the Genoa but the best thing to do is get them get them down to a sail maker I always say to people at the end of the season take them to the sail maker. Don't take them to him in March and expect them ready for April. Uh, take them at the start, end of the season. Get them belted before they get all wet and horrible. At least then they'll be kept nice and dry ready for your collection. This, this pilot berth bunk is quite wet. Uh, so we've obviously got water either coming in through the, the cockpit side uh, locker, um, not locker, port light, or we may have got some water coming in through the uh, the hatch here, you can see this water staining here, which gives a bit of a clue. But these cushions are very wet, which is always a great shame. But the good thing is they're zippable, so you could unzip them and get, get them whizzed off. Right, access to the fuel tank here. You've got to glue the stop tap for the turns. And it's, a, it's got a gauge on it as well. Where did I put my tool shares? The feeds from that are both copper, which is nice. Round here? Yeah. This lock is full of water. Oh. You know I said about the anodes and the fastenings corroded. You can come and get a photograph of this bit. But uh, basically that's very corroded and the, uh, the block is rotten and there's very stagnant water in there. The funny thing is the, the lining underneath this Luma hatch is actually quite dry. Uh, I wonder where it's coming from. Hunting for water is the hardest thing ever. You know, where does water come from? Sometimes you've just got to be patient and run a hose and see if you can see where it's coming from. But uh, certainly it's got in here. Oh, oh, sorry. And really when you're on board a boat, leaving them up is better than leaving them down. And some venting. Um, as you say, that one's soaking wet so that's not really helping at all. So why are you giving uh, up on this lovely boat? Um, this boat has been fantastic, but I've not been on her for far too long. Um, my daughter was born in 2018, um, I should get this right, my son was born last year, so... Yes, you get um, told off if you get those sort of things. It's just, there just isn't a time. This has been a fantastic boat for, for me, I bought it when I was 30, for taking friends um, from Southampton, where she was for a good sort of five, six years, and then from Chichester to, to the island, over to uh, Lymington. Um, to have a few drinks and come back the next day. Um, I just don't do that anymore. I won't be doing that for a while. And the kids aren't big enough yet for a, no. for a boat like this. Um, so it's, it's just, I feel like it's the wrong thing to do to let her kind of sink into more disrepair, um, you know, waiting for, for a time when I've got the time to, to fix her up and sail her again. As you've probably seen from the survey. <laughs>
Yeah, exactly. It's this yeah. is all the stuff that yeah. I, you know, that's quite possibly 20 years old. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's at that point it needs changing. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's good. It's good. It's just a shame that um, it's just a shame we've had water getting in, which yeah. has caused a lot of the framework around this galley area to go rotten. Which that, is yeah, I, I was wondering about that because that um, that looks sort of not original, doesn't it? The, the, no, the that, that's not far off how it was made. Really? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's um, all this is fairly much as I remember them being being done in the day. It was this bit here that's kind of chipped in to kind yeah. of just fit over this yeah, that's latch. Yeah, right. that, that's, um, that's what it does, yeah. Oh, that was, oh, really? That's, yeah, yeah. that's oh, factual. Oh, you're lighting it here, there's a, there's a hole there's, in the, in the yeah, pipe. Yeah, there's a, there's a bit of a bit of a risk. So, yeah, yeah, yeah lucky, um, <laughs> lucky yeah. nothing went up yeah. in the last um, 10 years. There's a, there's a switch in that locker which is completely closed, but I have no idea what it's for. Quite possibly the fridge. fridge. Yeah. yeah, okay. And there's, there might be some funny stuff up forward as well. There was a, a heater. The one thing I really didn't like the sound of was the um, there was an old-fashioned heater in yeah. the in the Viva, um, and it ran on kerosene. Um, and I just didn't like the idea. Really of sleeping. old tailored type things, is it? Yeah, you'll probably tell me it's safe as houses, but I just did not like the idea of sleeping with kerosene next to my head. So I yeah. I, I took that out, it sealed the sealed the vent up, and that was uh, that was that. But that's after I bought it, that was apart from sort of repairs. Yeah. That was pretty much all I. The only change I made. Yeah. Um, Summing up of where we got to today. Um, any pre-purchase survey or condition report, surveyor should be with you on a 30-foot boat, I hope, for at least four or five hours. Today we've been just over six and a half hours on this boat, um, which is a 30-foot yacht. We, we've, we've, I've been able to check the hull condition as best I can, the decks, the rigging, uh, the general structure inside. We found quite a few little things that uh, need doing, but unfortunately one of the things that I always feel should be available for a pre-purchase survey or a condition report is uh, power and unfortunately the batteries on board are no good so we haven't been able to test any of the, en the engine systems, uh, general electrics on the, on the boat, navigation equipment or anything like that. Uh, for a point of view of doing the safety checks basically everything on board the boat is out of date uh, so that's a quite simple safety check and then there's things like uh, ground chain and anchor needs to be looked at um, uh, and, and things like that need to be sorted out. Um. You mentioned um, it was a very dry boat um, and you were surprised about how dry it was for its age, so that, that's a good sign. Yeah, isn't it? yeah I mean, laminate-wise, because it's woven rovings, uh, it hasn't sucked up the moisture like some boats do. Um, so generally, she's pretty dry, but again, we have found areas of water trapped. Uh, we found an area of water trapped in, in this aft locker, which showed up on the meter, and again, we found a, a big pool of water in the in the bow locker, where that sail was actually soaking wet in the front there. And and, and what's annoying is it's not obvious where that water's come from. Um, it, it could be something stupid, you know, it, or it could be a, a deck fitting leaking. But until you actually know, you won't sort it out. So you've got to have a good look around and find these points. We've done our best to to, to, to show that the structure of the hull is there. Uh, and like any painting, it's the, it's the uh, getting the canvas work and the practice done, ready to fill all of the details in now. So and you've got lots of nice, ex nice expensive bills coming your way. And, but nothing, is there anything that would set the alarm bells ringing and would you know, say to you, don't go ahead with the purchase? I, I think for the value of the boat, you've just got to always be mindful of the fact you don't want to be spending more than the maximum value you can get for the boat. Now there's some people who say I don't really care because I just want the enjoyment and the, the biggest danger is we are so short of decent uh, boats for sale now since this pandemic that people are clutching at straws and not having surveys and, and, and this boat has shown that there are things that have come to light from a survey which if you don't have a survey you wouldn't have been aware of. What's even more sad is some people have surveys and then actually don't act upon what's been written down or recommended by the surveyor. Um, so we'll, we'll see what turns up, but certainly there are a few things that need, need looking at and a few things that need checking, uh, but it's going to be an interesting project for you guys.